That concludes component number one, which is identification of the jugular venous pulse. And now we're prepared to discuss quantitative assessment. This is otherwise known as jugular venous pressure or JVP. So we've moved from jugular venous pulse, which is the umbrella term, to jugular venous pressure, which is a specific term. When a clinician reports a JVP of eight centimeters of water or 16 centimeters of water, he or she is uh, reporting a quantitative assessment. And we use this every single day in the hospital. So we should begin by asking the question, what are we measuring? We're measuring right atrial pressure. And in order to properly interpret uh, a JVP, we have to be familiar with normal. When measured via uh, catheter in millimeters of mercury, normal pressure is less than six. When measured via exam in centimeters of water, it's less than eight. Why do we care about right atrial pressure? Well, it has tremendous diagnostic utility. When that undifferentiated patient comes in with dyspnea to the clinic or to the hospital, the JVP exam is absolutely critical and at best will provide you with a diagnosis right there at the bedside for free. At worst, it will narrow your differential diagnosis. Beyond its diagnostic utility, we often use it to establish and follow volume status in patients who are admitted to the hospital with decompensated heart failure. And that's because of the relationship between volume and pressure. So now that we know uh, what we are measuring and why we're measuring it, we're now ready to talk about how we measure it. So what we want to do is we want to measure the column of uh, blood that's sitting above the right atrium. Uh, that's the manometer, and that'll tell us in centimeters of water the pressure of the right atrium. The problem is, is we can't see the right atrium because it sits in the middle of the chest. So we have to use landmarks that we can see to extrapolate to the right atrium. If we can figure out, figure out how high that meniscus is above a landmark, and we know how high that landmark is above the right atrium, well, then it's simple mathematics to decide how high that column is above the right atrium. The angle of Louis is one such landmark, where it's classically said to be five centimeters above the right atrium in any position. They did a study in 2002 that's in our references section, uh, where they used CT imaging and trigonometry to determine the distance between the angle of Louis and the right atrium in various positions. And it turns out five centimeters is correct, but only in the supine position up to about 30 degrees. Beyond 30 degrees, it's more like eight to 10 centimeters above the right atrium. The clavicles are another landmark that can be used, but only in the upright position where they're 12 to 16 centimeters above the right atrium. So again, if we can figure out how high this column is above these landmarks, then it's a simple correction factor to determine what the JVP is, how high that column is above the right atrium. Now, textbooks love to use this image here where they have, they have a ruler, a, a kind of a vertical ruler at the angle of Louis. They have another straight edge. There's multiple hands involved. It looks very cumbersome. I've personally never done this before. And uh, there's a strategy that, that Pete taught me years ago uh, where you can measure the width of your hand. And that's what, I, that's what we do. Is I, so I know my hand is eight centimeters wide. And now we can use our hand in the position of that ruler. So the, the hypothenar aspect of our hand or the pinky side of our hand is down on the patient's angle of Louis. The thumb is pointed up towards the ceiling. And uh, now my palm is facing the patient's neck. Now I'll use my eyes and sort of visualize where is that meniscus. If the top of it is near the top of my hand and the patient's in the supine position where the, where the angle of Louis is five centimeters to the right atrium, well, my hand is eight, so I would say that's eight centimeters plus five is 13 centimeters of water. If it's half of my hand, I would say, okay, four centimeters plus five is nine centimeters of water. Maybe at the top of it, it goes above the top of my hand. So maybe I'll add a second hand, my left hand there, and I'll say, okay, it's a hand and a half. Well, for me, that's 12 centimeters plus five is 17 centimeters of water. And this is how we calculate the JVP at the bedside. This data comes from a 1973 study where they directly measured right atrial pressure and plotted it on the x-axis. And then they at the same time measured pressure within the right IJ, the left IJ, and the EJ, and they plotted those. What's that? They, they plotted those on the, on the y-axis from left to right. And this data demonstrates a couple of things. Number one, the right IJ is highly reliable for estimating right atrial pressure. This is quite a linear relationship. The other thing that this demonstrates is that the left IJ and the EJ are nearly as reliable as the right IJ. So you should feel comfortable using any of these vessels to calculate JVP. Okay. Now let's put these ideas to practice. So here we have a video. We've got a woman at 45 degrees here. And uh, we see movement in the neck. We're at a tangential angle. We see movement in the neck. We know it's venous because look at that inward component there. See how it sucks in? And look how diffuse it is. This movement goes all the way up to the angle of the jaw. So let's say we want to know how high this, this what, what is her JVP? Well, to be honest with you, in, if I were at the bedside, because I'm not sure if the top of the column is truly here. It could be up here. We, we just don't know. 
to know that I would sit the patient up a little bit and watch and watch the column of blood kind of drop down into maybe the top or middle of the neck. And then I, I would be truly confident that I'm seeing the top of it. And then I would make my calculation based off of that. But just for the sake of this example, let's assume that the top of the column is right here at the angle of the jaw. So if she's at 45 degrees and the, uh, the angle of Louis in that position is said to be eight to 10 centimeters above the right atrium. She's a slender woman, so we'll go with eight. So if we can figure out how high this column is above the angle of Louis, we simply add eight to it, and that's the JVP. And I will tell you that, that this is 12 centimeters above the angle of Louis, so we would say that's 12 plus eight is 20 centimeters of water. And uh, yes, the, the angle of Louis is sort of where the manubrium and, and sternum meet. Uh, there's sort of a change in angle there, and that's the angle of Louis. So uh, anytime you see indentations in a patient's forehead, you should immediately consider longstanding central venous pressure. And this is a patient uh, who has such a finding. And, and this is a gentleman that, that Pete and I saw together and we were sort of at the bedside. We, we both sort of noticed these indentations at the same time. We kind of looked at each, at each other, we nodded, and we reclined the patient back. And sure enough, those uh, veins engorged with blood. And this is a gentleman with markedly elevated central venous pressure. Here's a similar patient that I've just evaluated the other day as part of the procedure service. We were asked to come and do a, a paracentesis on this patient. And uh, I couldn't help myself. I mean, we're there for the procedure, but I couldn't help but notice these engorged veins in the patient's temple area. And in fact, when he turned his head, uh, these veins were, were everywhere on, it, on his head. And here's the video that goes along with it. So you can see the veins here. Look at this EJ, it's like a hose there. You got the inward component here with the IJ. And as we, and he's in the upright position, by the way, when we span to the left, look in the temple area, there's movement right, right in here. There's movement, there's an inward movement. That's classic uh, venous pulsation there. And so I asked his wife, I said, you know, um, I, I couldn't help but notice these veins. H have you noticed them? And she said, uh, yes, I have. I've noticed them for a couple, two, three months. And I've asked every, almost every clinician that this patient has seen about these veins. And not only were they unable to pro provide me with an answer, as to what it was causing them, but they, they seemed disinterested in the question. Well, we weren't disinterested. We were quite interested, and we asked the primary team to evaluate this and investigate this further, and he had a right heart cath done, and take a guess what his right atrial pressure was at this time. Now, he's in the upright position. Anybody have a guess? Yep, you guys are right on the money. 30 millimeters of mercury, which when you do the conversion, multiplied by 1.36, turns out to be 40 centimeters of water. So this gentleman was walking around with uh, markedly elevated central venous pressure for some months, and it simply wasn't recognized. And I think we've gone away from the fundamentals in medicine, and we're, we're uh, quite enthralled by technology, and, and we sort of moved away. Our, our fundamental skills have, have atrophied. We'd like to see that come back. If you look in the neck, you look at the right IJ, you can't find the pulse. Left IJ, can't find it. You've looked at the EJ, you can't find one of those. You've looked in the periauricular area, the temple, the patient's forehead, you cannot find the pulse anywhere. There is one last place to look, one last refuge, and that is the patient's hand. We're gonna let this video restart, but what you wanna do is you wanna start with the patient's hands at their side and you wanna evaluate whether they have visible veins on the dorsum of their hand. You can even look at yourself right now. Uh, some of us have them, some of us don't. Uh, in this case, this video is going to start back over here in just one moment. This gentleman does have visible veins in the dorsum of his hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to lift the hand higher than the central venous pressure and allow those veins to collapse. So here we go. We're going to lift it up. And these veins are collapsing. They're gone. They're completely flat. You see how they're flat here? Now what we're going to do next is slowly lower the hand down until we find that moment where the veins begin to fill with blood again. And they are starting to fill there they go so it's it's filled here so what we're going to do watch what i do with my left hand i'm going to extrapolate across and i'm going to try to figure out how high that column is above the angle of louis he's supine so his angle is five above his right atrium and uh those veins begin to fill again at 20 centimeters above the angle of louis so his central venous pressure is about 25. 